I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. We, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative. Conversation without compromise. Technically, tu uh, Santa Claus was Turkish. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, he's from our side. <laughs> yeah. <Leave him> alone. <laughs> um, well, and then the whole, like, concept of putting your children next to a jolly stranger is just, it's just so funny to me. <laughs> I, I would, I, I, I'd really like to see a Middle Eastern mall Santa. <laughs> uh, just go to, go to Dubai. You might, you might run into one there. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They probably have one in the mall set up to take pictures. They probably I'm do. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> they, but I bet it'd be, it'd pr they'd probably hire an old American man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's easy to find one. That well, you have to find a jolly white guy. I mean, that's that's the Santa look. Yeah. yeah. I want. I just want to kind of do my own. Again, I'm, I'm prepping. I'm prepping my business plan for this Christmas Ramadan overlap. I want to. I want to. Middle Eastern yes, Arab, 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 Arab grandfather in in, in, in in like a green Santa suit. <laughs> or you can have him wear like a a thobe and a, an Arab thobe and yeah. a chafia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like your shirt, you know, like coming together as Santa and <laughs> um, your classic uh, Arab guy. Yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mohammed bin Salman, Al Saud. Oh. So, in, in in the less in in the less fun way, but a probably more interesting way, the uh, after the last episode I did talking about Iraq, I noticed some really interesting parallels between modern Iraq and Judea when Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. It's actually it's actually really, really interesting how similar the circumstances are. Mm -hmm. So let me paint a picture for you. Okay. You've got this nation which has not had independence for very long. It was part of some it was part of the Assyrian Empire for a while, mm -hmm. the Persian Empire, and then this Greek Empire. And then they, they briefly had independence for a very short amount of time. And then that independence was taken away by Western invaders mm -hmm. who had various levels of involvement through various times in history. But as well as the Western forces, the Roman Empire, you also had the Persian Empire as well. So you had... You had... The, Parth the Parthians at one point invade Judea and take it over. And then the Romans came and they pushed them back. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is born very soon after the Romans had taken Judea back from the Parthians. So you've got a Western power, a power based in Persia, mm -hmm. and then very, very difficult circumstances for the people on the ground in Judea. Mm -hmm. They've had very little stability. There's, they, 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 haven't, they don't have the prosperity that they once had as a nation. And they're looking for somebody to fix things. So on top of all those circumstances, mm -hmm. you also have this very strict religious class, which basically makes themselves feel better about things by looking down 
on other people. Mm-hmm. That they present themselves as holy, as blameless, as, as better than everyone else, while being completely corrupt. Yes. Right. I mean, it was not to sound familiar. <laughs> oh, I wonder what comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. And, and then on top of that, you have various groups of people who want to bring about the end of everything and they want to bring in the messiah by staging a violent uprising against well everyone so at one point you have a revolt against the romans Mm -hmm. and then the city of jerusalem is fighting against them and while they're surrounded by the romans there are three different factions within Jerusalem fighting each other. So there's there's a lot of there's not many resources, there's not a lot of prospects, and when you have those things, it's very very easy to recruit young men to go and fight people. Mm-hmm. And that is the circumstances in Judea when Jesus is born. Mm-hmm. So it's crazy how similar the parallels are in modern Iraq to what we are today. And there's a class of people called the Sadducees who are benefiting quite well from Roman rule. Right. The, the, Romans, the Romans' governance and taxation and money is benefiting no one except this very specific group of people who keep the money for themselves and enrich their own position because of that. Sounds a lot like our Iraqi government. <laughs> so this this is the kind of this is kind of the place everybody's in and everyone's everyone's so sick of it they're looking for apocalyptic solutions. And there's one particular prophecy people are really interested in at this time. And that's the prophecy of the Messiah. So in the book of Isaiah. Remember the Netflix series I told you about? Yeah. Are you, you going to watch it? I'm absolutely going to watch that. Okay. I'm intrigued to see their portrayal. The Amer- I don't know. Would you say like the American or whose portrayal of the Messiah? Like. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm really curious. I think that. Yeah, I, I'm really curious how it's going to go down. It depends. It really. It really depends on who's writing it. Yes, uh, that's true. Yeah, that's Be- true. because it could. It could all be a bait and switch as well. There was this. There was this one comic called American Jesus, mm-hmm. about somebody like Jesus being born today. They and, yeah, they've made films about like Jesus and. Um, um, like Abraham and they've made Arabic shows about like Prophet Yusuf and so like there's never ending stories about whomever so this one's just like interesting to see like their take on the Messiah yeah yeah so yeah I'm wondering how straightforward it will be that if people with religious background will be able to predict it all or if it's written by somebody with a religious background and they're gonna right make it and i think i think that like personally i feel like if you don't want to watch it don't because it's something like oh it's propaganda whatever like you're leading people to believe the wrong message like at the end of the day it's just a show (laughs) people need to remember that so just take it as seriously as you would a Game of Thrones or something. I don't know. Some people take that pretty seriously. It's not real, people. <laughs> well. It, it's not real, James. It's not real. What, what's fascinating about uh, Game of Thrones is actually... Uh, and spoilers for season eight. So stop listening. Is the, I will stop listening because I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never, oh wait. The no, season. you know, you know enough. This is spoilers for season seven. Oh, okay. That's fine. So, okay. 
you think about you think about who Jon Snow is. Mm-hmm. He is the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He's hidden away as a baby in obscurity. Spends his life lives a humble life in of service to other people. Mm-hmm. And then extends love to his enemies then is killed by his people for for that and then rises from the dead so it's very similar to the jesus story interestingly right so so the, the prophecy that a lot of people were looking to is in the book of isaiah which is 600 years before jesus And it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy of harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So that's descri- that's kind of describing what sounds like economic prosperity and then the removal of the invaders, right? It's, it's, this, be- it's this era of being stepped on by people is over and that we're, they're burning what's left of it. It says, for to us a child is born to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and unhold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Hmm. So the premise there, right, talking to people who live in a land of darkness, deep darkness, Mm -hmm. that has experienced poverty, oppression, corruption, injustice, and constantly trampled over by other armies. Right. And you've got people living in the middle of these things, longing for some sort of change and god's promise to that is this messiah which means literally means anointed one Mm -hmm. and that comes from this idea that when someone becomes king in the hebrew culture they pour oil over their head to symbolize god's anointing on them to do this task that he's given them right so this messiah this anointed one is going to come given as a child and it says the government shall be upon his shoulders and then the increase of his government there will be no end Mm -hmm. so the idea is in the middle of this oppressive time you have the beginnings of eternal peace through this messiah so what everyone's expecting to happen is they're expecting a military leader who's going to come and he's going to fight against the Romans and he's going to restore national Israel back to its proper borders at the time of David. And then there's going to be peace from outsiders because he's going to be a strong king. Mm -hmm. And it's a very natural way of thinking about these things. Often violence seems to be the solution to these things, which it can be. Right. Having a good national defense and a, and a good king is, is is good for a country up to a certain point. Right. Because it never lasts. Right. So David, the one who was the second king of Israel, had all that. He was a just governor. He was a strong warrior. And he was able to protect the nation from its enemies so that his son, Solomon, oversaw this huge kingdom of prosperity. Mm-hmm. But that lasted for all of David's life, all of Solomon's life, and about a year after Solomon died. And then it was divided by civil war. Right. 
So how this plays out is that during the midst of this time, Jesus is born in the middle of this Roman census. And basically, Augustus Caesar, who, who had just formed the Roman Empire, the Roman was a republic before that, and he was the first emperor of Rome. Mm -hmm. And he has this census where everyone has to go back to the city they were born in. And they have to... So, every, so Mary, who is pregnant, and Joseph, her husband. So Mary isn't pregnant like a normal woman. She's, she's visited by the angel Gabriel. And he says, you're going to be with child. You're going to have... You're going to give birth to the Messiah and he's going to save his people. References this prophecy. Mm -hmm. And Joseph, when he finds that she's pregnant, he's, uh, he's going to divorce her quietly. He, call, he calls him a righteous man. That He doesn't want to put shame on her, right. but he also doesn't want to be in a marriage with a woman who's carrying another man's baby. Right. So he, he decides to divorce her quietly because that's the kind of character, that's the kind of character he has. That he's not the kind of man who, when he's betrayed, wants to expose and shame the other person. He wants to cover her dignity and honor, despite that. But he's visited by an angel as well, who explains the situation to him, and then he's all in. So then they have to go back to the town that he was born in, which is the town of Bethlehem. And because... <coughs> It's um, a lot of people are from there. The town is crowded and there's no room for, there's, there's no room for them to stay with family. So they have to stay in the lower area where the animals sleep as well. And that's where Mary gives birth to Jesus. And the things that surround his birth are really interesting. So the first thing that happens is there's angels who come and proclaim his birth and there's shepherds watch outside watching sheep and they, they kind of go to visit the baby mm -hmm. when he's born. And then the other, the other aspect is that there's these magi in the East. So the magi, have you heard the term magians? I have not. So it's the way that ancient cultures talked about the Persian religion. Okay. So, it, so in Islamic sources, actually, that whenever they talk about the Zoroastrians, they call them Magians. And it's this religious order so it centered out of Babylon, Susa, Persia, Iraq and Iran, basically, but mostly Iran. And they've seen a star in the sky and they're following it because they, they know it predicts the birth of the king. Mm -hmm. So then they go to the king of Judea, who's a puppet of Rome called Herod. And they say, we, we've, we saw a star in the sky that says a new king was born. We're here to visit him. But the, 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 so Herod says, oh, just tell me, tell me where you find him and I'll come and worship him. And so that they go. But Herod is a maniac. Herod has, I believe, two of his own sons killed for because of, he's scared they're plotting against him. And Herod is not excited about the prospect of another king and has a plan to kill this, this king. So the, the Magi, they come to Jesus bringing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they're, they're, but they're warned not to go see Herod. They, they, they figure out the plot and they avoid him. And then Joseph is visited in a dream by an angel that says, you've got to get out of here because Herod's coming to kill you. So Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they flee to Egypt. So they have, they're, they're basically refugees in a sense, except that Egypt was owned by Rome as well. So they're not 
technically going into like a different political system, but they've left everything they know mm -hmm. in order to go to a different country because that this megalomaniac king is, is coming after him. Herod can't find him and then orders that all children under two, year old, two, year, two years old in Bethlehem be killed. So there's this slaughter that happens in the village. And that symbolic of the kind of era Jesus is born into. So Jesus, after Herod dies, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus move back to Nazareth, which is in a different Roman province, but is still part of historic Israel called Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And he grows up there. He has a completely normal life up to being 30 years old. And then he starts, then he's baptized and he's submerged under water. And then he, as he comes out of the water, a voice comes out of heaven saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Immediately from there, he goes into the wilderness and is eats nothing or drinks, I think, for 40 days. And while he's there, he's tempted by Satan. And Satan says, if you're the son of God, turn this this, these stones into bread. Does it? And then he takes him to the top of the temple. And Jesus replies by saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, which is quoting the Torah. Mm -hmm. He's taken to the top of the temple. And he said, if you jump off from here, God will send his angels to catch you. And Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord God to the test, which is also from the Torah. And then Satan brings him to a very high mountain gives him a vision of all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, all of this can be yours if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, you man shall worship God alone. And then Satan left him. So, so then after this temptation, where he's basically presented with this life of, indulgence in getting what his destiny is the easy way but refusing that he then begins his ministry and what he starts doing is he goes around telling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so what he's referencing there is that prophecy we're talking about mm -hmm. and many others like it which is talking about this reign of peace mm -hmm. from that's going to start with the king and then go outwards. And there's never going to be an end to that. Right. That yeah, government. Yes, correct. I'm like thinking about it from my end. And you're right. Like the point of the person is to bring peace. And after that, there's no end. So, yeah. It's, it's interesting that like all our views are similar, but our, the person is just different but i think regardless the objective is to think that we as people want peace like that's what we want so we'll take who we can get yeah <laughs> so what's interesting about jesus though is that the way he approaches the kingdom of god is very different from what people were expecting Mm -hmm. the, the the main thing Jesus is talking about is people's relationship to God themselves in, in that what people wanted were large political solutions when in, when in reality most of our problems come from character issues and political problems tend to be these character issues mm -hmm multiplied on a wide scale. So the corruption in the nation is not because the Romans had taken over. The corruption in the nation was because the people were corrupt. Yes, right. I wholeheartedly believe that. So there's, a, there's this tendency this, that happens in nations all the time, that having this external enemy to focus on is 
is just this very easy thing to scapegoat all your problems onto. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that Jesus almost never even mentions the Roman Empire. They're, occup they're literally occupied with this foreign power that's taking a bunch of their natural, their natural resources away. Mm -hmm. And Jesus barely mentions it because it's not really the issue that's causing all their problems. So what he starts with is reaffirming God's standards of righteousness. Right. And demonstrating people's inability to meet those. And then well, what, what do you do? And, and so what the, the, the people he's taking aim at, we talked about these corrupt religious leaders and he takes aim at them because what they're doing, there's two ways of not taking God's command seriously. Mm -hmm. One is by ignoring them entirely. The other is by making them softer and easier for yourself. So you feel like you can do them. That you're, that you're lowering the bar so you feel like you can jump over them. Right. And that's what a lot of religious leaders do. They have to make a low bar, lower bar for themselves than God's bar so that they can feel righteous about themselves. And then they find people to look down on to make them feel, okay, well, look at me compared to this person. Right. And Jesus tells a very specific... Which you're not supposed to do. No. <laughs> because if you realistically look at God's standards, what you're going to see is a standard that you cannot meet. Right, exactly. And so while another person may... It's, it's like we're running a 20-mile race. Mm -hmm. One person collapses a mile in. Another person collapses five miles in. Another person collapses 15 miles in. The, the, it's ridiculous for the person who collapses 15 miles in to look at the others and think, ha, look at those losers. Because no, no one finished. Right. Everyone collapsed at some point. Right. And if you don't... And if you look down on people, then you're being a hypocrite. Right. And that's the chief charge that's Jesus has against the religious leaders. A, yeah, exactly. Like, as a religious leader, you're not supposed to, like, preach and then also judge. Because then what are you doing? Like, don't do, don't do either. Like, don't tell me what to do. And then at the same time, be like, why are you doing this? So either like help someone out to be a better person because you yourself are also trying to be a better person or just stay quiet because regardless, like no one's the judge of another and no one should have a say in how people act or what they do. Everyone's journey, their struggles are different compared to others. So to willingly be like oh well why don't you pray or why don't you go to church like save it the way jesus talks about it is he says when you pray don't pray like the hypocrites who love to be seen who go or they'll go pray in loud voices mm -hmm. when you pray go pray in your room where your father who hears in secret will reward you so it's a very, it's a different, it's a different way of approaching things because usually revolutionaries say, our problem is the Romans, our problem is the Americans, our problem is the Iranians, whoever you're going to blame. And if we, if you support my movement, we'll overthrow them. And then that's the beginning of when our problems can get better. Jesus is in that kind of situation. He doesn't do that. He says, your problem is you. You're, 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 you're your own problem yeah and and so he 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 starts with from the inside out and this is connected to the kingdom of heaven right the way jesus jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like the grain of a mustard seed it's the smallest plant that you plant in the field the food for field in the field for food mm -hmm. Yet when it grows, it becomes a tree that the birds in the air can nest in. So the idea is, it's this almost invisible expansion 
of his kingdom. Right. Which you never notice growing, but it's always growing. It's not something you think, okay, there goes the kingdom of God. It's something that you, you know, you look away for a few years and be like, wait, wait, what? Where did that come from? And that's the kind of thing Jesus is talking about. Mm -hmm. That it's this revolution of the hearts and hearts and minds of people, which seems like the small and significant thing, but it's it's this revolutionary world changing thing. Right. I don't know if you've heard of like uh the death of uh Imam Ali alayhi Yes. So like to hear the way like he treated his killer, it just like humbles you to like a million degrees because if him himself could like tell his uh, his people to leave his killer alone and not tie his hands because it might hurt his um, arms and to make sure he's well fed and he has something to drink like as a as a Shia Muslim like I take those examples and I tell myself like if I do have a grudge against someone, like it's my duty or it's my job to let them know and give them that chance to like apologize or not apologize if they don't want to, but like to hold on to that grudge, it doesn't feed your heart any any good. So, so I'll, and when Ali is assassinated, right, there's yes. is a poison sword, mm -hmm. right? It, so I heard another Shia tell me there's this saying. I can't, maybe you can help me. There's a straight line from Jesus to Ali to Hussein. There's a straight line, what do you mean? I, I don't know. It's, it's, but they're basically they're saying that if you look at, if you look at Hussein, you look at Ali and their character and their deaths. The service to people. The service to people. And uh, yes, so like, they're like willingness. I think the sacrifice to people. I think that's what it comes down to. Like, I am sacrificing, um, not technically like sacrifice, like gi giving myself up, but like this is the right thing to do for God. And this is no matter what anyone else is going to say, like I am serving God at the end of the day. And that's how it, I think what you mean by line, like they all go back to God. Um, possibly that they're just pointing out the parallels which there, there are some really interesting parallels there especially with jesus and hussein because ultimately because really with hussein you've got that you've got somebody who's supposed to be at least in the shia eyes the true heir to the kingdom or mm -hmm. the Khalifa. Mm -hmm. The Imam Ali yeah. was the true heir in the Shia community. <laughs> I just don't want I don't want to have people to come attack me. In the Shia community, Imam Ali was the true heir and then um his son, Imam Hassan, and then after him, Imam Hussein. Yes. And, and so when when so, so the and I think whatever side somebody's on on this, I don't think there's anyone who's like super excited about Yazid necessarily. Yeah. It, and I think it baffles me just a little because like regardless, these are the grandsons of the Prophet and um, it's the son of law or the cousin of the Prophet in Ali. So like regardless, you shouldn't be talking about the Prophet's family. Like you don't have to follow them. But like respect them, and and that and, and so there's the interesting that there's the interesting parallel right? Right. that that somebody who should have been entitled to respect was not, mm -hmm. and there's this jealousy about that, and there's this seeming threat to that perceived by people, and then they plot and murder this person. And that's exactly what happens to Jesus, that he's not making any threatening actions to right. anybody, anybody's right. position. And yet, neither of them, like, I think that's where the line also, like, crosses is that neither of them were bringing any harm to their people or to the place that they were in. But, like, 
they to the outside world they were a threat and so they had to be gone the the the, the threat is somewhat existential because the kingdom of god and the kingdom of man cannot ultimately live side by side mm -hmm. and and that's the prophecy that was in in the book of there's a book called daniel which is also about 600 years before jesus and it talks about the kingdom of heaven coming down as a small stone that grows to fill the whole earth and shatters to pieces all the kingdoms of the earth blesses the nations but destroys the kingdoms so the difference is a nation is where people live and a group of people live a kingdom is one man's power position and dominion over earth so this this reaction that we see is 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 the same thing you see when when jesus is there that by nature of who he claims to be and who he is the religious leaders who have gotten to their position of power don't want to lose that ultimately what they're demonstrating is that while they claim to love god that they're liars what they love is the power and position and sense of entitlement following god mm -hmm. following god or being seen to follow god gives them that they honor god with their lips but their hearts are a long way away from him yeah that the initial like stance of power comes from like that time like i want the power like it should be mine and ultimately when you're interacting with living god that's you, there are limits on your power this visit god's not anti-authority but there are limits on your power that you suddenly have rules you have limitations to what you can and can't right. do to people and people hate that all people hate that all of us hate having limitations put on us right it's just something that's kind of naturally within us that kicks against that. And when people come into the ultimate form of the of, of God's kingdom, coming face to face with what he wants, they react violently against it and try and destroy it. Right. So the the I think the the difference between the parallels between Hussein and Jesus are interesting, at least from, at least from the biblical narrative, because people don't necessarily believe in the death of Jesus. In if my brother was here, he'd agree with you. Really? Yes. <laughs> like the their parallels and their like their um, similarities of like humbleness and serving and their good for their people. The 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 other thing that's interesting is that if you read the stories, Hussein knows he's going to die. Yes. And he, do, and he does what he's going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's a dead parallel to the narrative of Jesus. Because Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. I have the authority to lay it down. And I too have the authority to pick it up again. So Hussein's death, from, from what I understand, he's making, he's sacrificing himself to make a point about injustice, to show that to the world, to show what power can do when it's in the wrong hands and to kind of make this statement that's going to echo throughout all of history and make people think about how those things happen. Right. And there's some similarities in that to the idea of the cross, but it's not just that. That it's it's not just a statement of look at how bad people are, which it certainly is. Yes. It's also it's also it's more than that. It's a statement of how much God loves us, because it's not just a sacrifice for the sake of oh look to to make people look bad and look what you did, but it's it's 
him willingly giving his life on behalf of other people so they don't have to give their lives. They don't have to face God's wrath eternally. The other big difference is obviously the resurrection. That death is not the last word. And I don't think people would say it is with um with with Hussein either, but it's a it's a little more it's a little more you kinda of have to figure out this. There's no clear pathway throughout human history of oh, these are the next steps for things to get better. Um and they're like Shia Muslim community, like um through scholar like knowledge, um, there is someone, like you would say the Messiah, but not the Mahdi. The Mahdi. Um and um and then Prophet um Isa or Jesus is to come with him as well. And so that whole like parallel of like Jesus will rise back is interesting. It is. All, all, all roads seem to lead to Jesus at some point. Right, right. Like, he's still in the story, <laughs> regardless of what anyone thinks or says. Like, it's there. Like, the idea of it, it's floating. It is. So I think the, the big difference, other than the, other than the actual death and resurrection, and... It's it's it, it's very unusual that Muslims believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. You'll you'll find some, but to be fair, you'll find some Muslims who believe anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, we won't mention who those are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I had I want in fact I want I once made a friend who had a really 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 weird way of interpreting the Quran mm-hmm. that. He was. He 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 he's, he said he he was a Muslim who believed that Jesus was God and believed he died and rose from the dead. I'm like, wait, what? But the Quran the Quran says they did not kill him nor they crucify him. No. It's like it's like no, it wasn't the Jews that killed him and crucified him. It was the sovereign plan of God from all eternity to that he died and rose from the dead. It's like, <laughs> are you reading the right Quran? <laughs> it's like technically, it. He, he technically has a point if you want to re- read it really pedantically, but there's no way that's what that's, that's what they're trying to convey there. Right? No. It's... <laughs> okay. It's okay. Some people read it, misinterpret it all the time. It's like the hijab, for example. Like it says that women should keep a veil on them. Um. And cover their chest and etc. But then you have people interpret veil differently. So you can't really say like, no, the veil is hijab. You have to put on the hijab. Like to some people, the veil means something else, just like covering yourself. So I can't go to a non-hijabi Muslim and say like, no, you're wrong. The hijab is the right way. Like for me, it's the right way. For that person, it might not be. So. Interpretation goes different ways in the Quran. Like you can't, you can't tell someone they're wrong at the end of the day, because it's it's all about how you interpret it. Even though like there's certain things that are straightforward, but then there's certain things where you're like, um, so it just it's just how it works sometimes. Yes. So taking the taking the um, death and resurrection aside, which is significant. What's also significant is what you believe Jesus is doing right now, because in Islam, Jesus is still the Messiah, right? It's Isa al Masi. So the idea of the Messiah is there. So, so then in Christianity, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he is the he is the Messiah. And he's a messiah in Islam as well. Uh-huh. But I, I, I find that most people... Well, how, how would you describe that? What, what do you think it means that Jesus is the messiah? Um, I don't know. I like The messiah is, we said, like the messenger, the rightful 
messenger, right? Or the annotated one? Yeah. Um, so like, for, for, I think the majority of Muslims, they know that an anointed one is coming. Um, Shia Muslims think it's the Mahdi. Um, and then, uh, and then Jesus with him. So, there isn't a straightforward answer for this, because regardless, there is a, like, an anointed one, but, like, Jesus, regardless, or Prophet Asa will be with him. So, like, you can't say there's one person. Well, because, sure, but then Jesus has the title in the Quran, Isa yes. al-Masih, right? Jesus the Messiah. So, it... Like that's that is the thing with the Quran, is that it's assuming you have a lot of background to everything going into it, because it's written in this really interesting cultural milieu of uh, sort of like sixth century Arabia, which has rich rich traditions about hood and all all the all the sort of history of the region about Abraham and Ishmael and. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very rich, rich stories. And, and so I think that when it talks about Jesus being the Messiah, people, they, there's, there's just kind of an implicit understanding there already, which isn't really explained. Because I, I think, well, what is a Messiah? So, so in, generally in the Islamic sense, it means the same thing, but at some point in the future, that God's kingdom does come with Jesus, but just kind of like an anvil falling on civilization. And Jesus is going to come back over the, the mosque in Damascus. He's going to break the crosses, kill the swine, and unite earth. So he's this... The he's king. a very symbolic figure in the coming of what's to come. It's very, very symbolic. So, like, I can't say, like, no, he's to prove everyone else wrong, but no, he's like to help bring that like peace. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah, so so if that's yeah, obviously if that's true, it would be a pretty huge unifying factor, right? It's it wouldn't like, be a bad thing because like either way, it's <laughs> Jesus, it's Prophet Isa. So like, it's it's I don't know. I feel like when the time comes, people will have that choice to make. So the, the, the biblical way it's presented is that the, the, the Messiah's job was to die for the sins of the people, mm -hmm. then to ascend to heaven, and then rule over earth. So the, the way Christians would see history, which is why we're in the year 2019 still, is that the kingdom of God came with Jesus, and like leaven, like you like yeast in a, in bread. Mm -hmm. This is the illustration Jesus uses. It's like adding the kingdom of God is like adding yeast to a piece of bread, right. and then when you come back, it's all it's all large. So the idea is that you have a gradual increase of peace and prosperity and justice on earth. That all the kingdoms of the earth are broken to pieces, and that more and more people become part of God's kingdom. And it is interesting to look at human history of, in those terms, of what kind of everything that's said about that mm -hmm. is true. We have people of every nation now who believe in the God of Israel. And when I say God of Israel, just in the historic sense, right? right, right. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that that's growing, growing, that generally over time, the kingdoms and empires are being smashed to pieces, that the world now exists as nations more than it exists as empires. And it doesn't mean it's all one line, mm -hmm. but certainly, if you look at how powerful empires were 2,000 years ago, then how powerful they were 500 years ago, it's less powerful then a thousand years then a thousand years ago less powerful five hundred years ago less powerful and then today while America may have a sort of cultural 
empire to an extent. It's it's not the same as things were two thousand years ago. Right. Like you can never have an impeachment trial for Augustus Caesar. Right. And whatever you think of that. Well, they did have an impeachment for a president. <laughs> so, it, it, in ways, like it's changed clearly, but like he wouldn't be hanged. You can't hang him. You can't hang him. <laughs> That's how it works. Well, you could. It depends on the crime, though. Like you'd have to have. They don't have hangings here. Okay, yeah, you couldn't hang them, technically. <laughs> I was like, wait, <laughs> we're in the same country, right? They, they yeah. don't allow for that here. But I think one state still does. Yeah, I think so. I think one state still has firing squads as well. I don't know why they ban that. That seems like a really humane way to go, to be honest. What is it? A firing squad. What is that? It's when, like, five people with guns shoot you. Oh, jeez. If I was going to be executed, that's the way I'd want to go, though. That's how? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not saying I want to be executed. I'm just saying if I was going to be executed. Why that way? Yeah. Why, but why that way? It, it, I mean, it seems like if you over quickly. <laughs> yeah. It seems kind of dignified. Well, yeah, the hanging, you feel it. Yeah. The drowning, you feel it. Yeah. And then the poison or the IV shot, you feel it as well. Like, it's just slow death which is like yeah i just don't believe in it like why i know there's awful people in the world but like i don't i don't believe humans should have the right to kill like that the, the, I, just my personal opinion <laughs> the, that's like a whole other episode right there <laughs> uh the executions I'm. I'm. That penalty. That, yeah, that should be a whole episode. <laughs> yeah, we should. Okay, that's that's actually really good because I I I 100 believe I I basically personally I prefer a much lower rate of incarceration and more sort of corporal punishments. Mm -hmm. So if somebody, you know, gets drunk, crashes their car into a statue, I think they should have to repay it to. You get the statue fixed and get like hit with a stick like twenty times or something. I don't think that puts you in jail. I yeah, I think like if they didn't harm anyone, yes, probation and then like work to pay back whatever you ruined. Um, but like obviously if you're a harm to like children or humans in general, um, but like if you're like psychologically unaware of how harmful you are, that's like, that's not jail. That shouldn't be jail. It should be like a mental health institute. So like, it, that's, that's my take on this whole system is that people get misplaced and people get given longer sentences for small crimes. I don't know if you heard, but... <clears throat> Uh, I don't remember what governor it was, but he just released 600 inmates. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah? I think it was Arkansas? I think so, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah. Insane. <laughs> yeah, I would basically, I'd basically be, I, I'd basically have jails very minimal for, for, for things like murder and rape. I'd have those be capital crimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I w if that's provable, uh, I would have those people executed, unless the victim themselves extends forgiveness. Right. And then there'd be r restitution there. But that's 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 the purview of the victim, more more than anything. And then I'd basically have minimal jail for for, for most things. Yeah, like for like drug possession. Um, for like. Accidentally, or like things like people have been called out about like leaving your children at home because you needed to work or needed to go pick up groceries, things like that that are so like really so stupid in other words. Yeah, and so I think with those types of things, they could become they they could become exacerbating evidence, and something bad does happen. But those things in themselves would not. Yeah, if they like aren't 
If they have not harmed another soul, what are they being in jail for? That's my question. Yeah. So, so I think if one of the biblical laws is that you ought to build a parapet around your roof, which means you're liable for other people's safety. Mm -hmm. But there's no roof parapet inspector that comes around being like, yeah, you get a fine for not having one. It's if somebody if something happens and you haven't taken proper precautions for their safety, then you're liable for that. But outside of that, you you do you. Right. Um so so things have gradually changed since the time of Jesus in a way that is completely consistent with what the Bible says the kingdom of God will be like. But the way Jesus has people approach the kingdom of God isn't to try and establish a state against the Romans where they're going to take over everything and then liberate the nation and, and do that. What he does is he sort of builds this community within a community. The, the people who trust him and follow him, he tells them to love each other, to take care of each other, to be honest with each other, and to form this, to be like a city on a hill that shines light outwards to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that in Iraq right now, if you're if, if people are hoping for the government to come and to finally fix the economy, fix the community, it, it's just not going to happen. No. There's, there's going to be a long wait for a train that is never coming. Yeah. Uh, a, it, it needs healing right now more than anything. Like, and to say, like, the, to just put it on the government itself, is not realistic, I'll be honest here, but, like, people are the problem as well. Like, we're not, I'm not saying, like, don't protest, don't whatever, like, by all means, but, like, then you have certain people within those protests that aren't actually good. Like, they throw them in there, and then that's what's caused, like, the riots and the killing of innocent people. The... The government certainly has a place to play in things, yes. But it's limited. It's it's only, there's only so much you can actually even even do. So Jesus is Jesus. When Jesus says to his community, he does have them speak to the authorities. He does hold them. He holds the authorities to the standards of justice that they've promised to uphold. But when he's he's struck. While he's being questioned, and he says, "What? Why do you? What? Why do you strike me? Be, what? What crime have, com have I committed?" And, uh, and so he holds them to the to the standards. His followers hold the government to the standards that they promise to uphold, but they're not looking for the government to fix their problems. They they are trusting each other, they're taking care of each other, they're helping each other, they're being honest with each other, they're building each other up yes. as this community within a community. And ultimately, the story of Judea ends badly because they trust in violent men, they revolt against the Romans, the Romans come, they go from town to town, city to city, destroying it, taking slaves, and then eventually they surround Jerusalem and then they sack the city, they burn it to the ground, they destroy the temple, and they take the whole Jewish nation into slavery. The whole Jewish nation, the whole of Jerusalem, except the Christians. Because what Jesus had said is as you're standing in Jerusalem, he says that you look at all these fine stones. I tell you, not one of these stones will be left standing upon another. And armies will surround Jerusalem. 
and the city's end is near. So when you see the armies surrounding, get out of the city, run, get out of here. This is going to happen within a generation. And so the Christians in Jerusalem fled to a city called Pella in modern-day Jordan, and they, they survived the Roman attack on Judea. So I think that I, I think that you, for Iraq to survive, I think you've got to get pockets of people committed to each other, committed to truth, committed to absolutely to what's what's right, regardless of how the political situation goes. Yeah, they they need someone that they can trust. That know that it's not someone out for power, out for money, but actually out for restore to restore what's been broken. And and, and that's and that is the message of the Messiah in the Bible, that that person is not a hypothetical person who's going to come in the future. It's not a political leader. That person is in heaven now. right? You, you can trust him today, and he can provide for all your needs. Mm-hmm. That's the message of the, of the kingdom of God, that God loves you personally. He's done everything that you need to be right with him through his death and resurrection. And that he'll provide for all your needs. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. All the nations need these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the biblical system starts with a trust in God for the forgiveness of your sins, for your future, and for your provision. And if you know that everything is going to be taken care of for you, that means that you can be good to others. It means, because if you don't know that you're going to be okay, well, why not steal? Why not take a bribe? You, right. you, what's going what's gonna, to, you, you, I've got to live in the real world. Right. But if God has promised you that he'll provide for your needs, that he'll take care of the things you need, if you seek first his kingdom, that's what it comes back to like how strong is your belief is your trust is your faith in god himself because that's what our our people are believe in the prophets or the messenger or whomever is they they did what god had asked them to do they believed and regardless of them knowing their outcome or not like they did it and so, are we as humans capable of doing that too? And the 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 answer the Bible would have to that question is because Jesus is in heaven as King. The answer is a definitive yes, because He sends what He calls His Holy Spirit, which is God living inside of us. It gives us the power to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It gives us the power to heal from our wounds, to forgive those who have wronged us, to bless other people, regardless of how they treat us. Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Because even the Gentiles, the non-Jews, love those who love them. But be sons of your heavenly Father, who makes rain fall on the just and the unjust. That he God gives good gifts to all people, good and bad. How much more? And he and he has the right to say, No, you're bad, I'm not giving you this. Yet he still gives good, gracious gifts. How much more do you as a human being need to be gracious towards fellow sinners, fellow people who are who are broken like you? And if you have a group of people who are all, all the, who all trust God, who are all dependent upon Him, who are all being provided by for Him, eventually, that keeps growing when as all of the things around them fall. So when the nation of Judea fell, God's kingdom did not fall, and then they face three hundred years of up and down persecution in the Roman Empire underground. But it doesn't go anywhere because it's not rooted in any 
system of government or leadership. Mm-hmm. It's, it's rooted in people's hearts and minds spread out all throughout the world. And then in one fateful day in 312, I believe, you have the Edict of Milan and Christianity is now a legal religion. And then within 50, like 55 years or something, that Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire, which provides these whole bunch of problems in and of itself. But still, it's an amazing thing that's happened. So over the next hundred years of that, people people get this idea that Roman Christianity are synonymous. It doesn't take long for people to combine those two things. But then the Roman Empire starts to fall, just like Jerusalem did, and the Ostrogoths come and they sack the city of Rome, and the whole world is in confusion. So this guy called Augustine writes this book called The City of God, reminding people that God's kingdom is eternal, that it lives on despite what what may happen to the earthly things we put our hope in. Yeah, right, right. So the Bible sees nations as a gift from God. Cities, nations. God loves both of those things and blesses both of those things, but they're not eternal things. Right. God's kingdom is not based on this earthly political rule. Correct. But it's based on the transformation of hearts and minds throughout human history mm-hmm. of people who, who trust him. And that will continue to make the world a better place in a million little invisible ways that you don't notice if you're looking. Right, like, I've given you this, what will you do with it? Yeah. Yeah. So, it always is, is, is always expanding. So, that's the key difference, right, is that Jesus, everything kind of gets, you've got this one idea that the kingdom of God comes down into history like an anvil in the future when Jesus comes back with the Mahdi with some ambiguous things between then and now, right? Could a rat get yet better? Yes. Will it get worse eventually, inevitably? Also, yes, in, in, in that sense, right? You've, you've kind of got this view of things getting worse and worse until the Mahdi and Jesus right. come back. Mm-hmm. And you, for sure, in the Bible, you have some, you have these things where you have definite claps of, of some things and Jesus coming back. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is not something that's a future thing that's going to happen. It's something we can actually live in now. That You can trust God for the provision you need. You can see him show up in your life. And you, you have no idea how he can transform the world. But the the Bible is actually optimistic about Iraq specifically. Oh, is it? Is it now? It is. So there's a really fascinating chapter in Isaiah. Um, So it talks about... um, this kind of turmoil happened in Egypt. It says, In that day, the Egyptians will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand that the Lord of hosts shakes over them. And the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Everyone, so Judah would be, you know, where Israel is. Right? Everyone to whom it is mentioned will fear because of the purpose that the Lord of hosts has purposed against them. In that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord of hosts. One of these cities is called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, a pillar to the Lord of hosts, the Lord at its border. It will be a sign of witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. So, again, this is talking about Egypt as a nation suffering. Then it says, when they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day, and worship with sacrifice and offering, and they will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, 
and they will return to the Lord, and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. So Assyria would be modern-day Iraq. And Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be a third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. (laughs) So, God says to Assyria, to the area that's around, He calls it the work of his hands. That God has good purposes for the country, despite how impossible to see it might be right right now. But but he has good. And this isn't talking about some... This isn't just talking about some, you know, apocalyptic end where Mm. God's kingdom comes out of heaven like an anvil, smashes everything, and oh, okay, Iraq's okay now. It's talking about Assyria being the work of God's hands with Israel and Egypt, right? That's like the most bizarre thing to imagine right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, they're a blessing in the midst of the earth. Right. The Iraq's future is not desolation and war. Yes, one would hope and pray for that it's not. <laughs> But his future is a blessing in the midst of the earth to, uh, that's called the work of God's hands. Right. You know, a lot of my Iraqi friends um, that like live the, their good majority of their life are just like baffled by like how much it's gone through and how much it's had to deal with over like the years and it's crazy because, like, Kuwait is, like, right next to it, and you see, like, such a different, it's like, it's a 360-degree turn. When you go into Kuwait, you're like, what? Like, it's, they're literally an hour apart, like, from Kuwait to, like, my city, Basra. Such a difference, which is insane. But, like, Kuwait is, like, very clean, very, like, well-kept. Their, um, their sheikh or their ruler is very good to their people, you know. No no country is perfect, but, like, and then you go into Iraq and you see, like, how much, like, it's gone through and how much it is going through. And you're like, why? Like, why? You just ask yourself why. And so... In my hope, I think, in my mind, I just know that this isn't going to last long. Like, the end of the day, I know that God knows best, and I have to, tr- I have to trust that in order to live with what's going on. The Something that I think that Iraqis in the country and the, in the diaspora should be, should be thinking about is... I think one thing that's making the country stagnant right now from a cultural perspective is that a lot of people are looking at other countries and thinking, okay, well, why don't we have this? Right. Right. They're comparing themselves to Saudi Arabia or to the US or a, a lot of Which others. they shouldn't. Right. But at the same time, they should be well off because they are an oil country they are they have the means to be a well-established country but they're not i I think what needs to happen is there needs to be some return to the foundations because you can't just and then this is the whole problem with the iraq war is the idea is you can just drop down the modern modern american system in the middle of the middle east and but yeah there we go no (laughs) Is not the last thing we need. Here's some have. guns, some money, and some democracy. Just yeah, go, we'll, go have fun, guys. We'll throw in a few ISIS members in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? So, if you look at how why America was founded, is that there were people who were sick of the Puritans who were sick of being persecuted in England, mm-hmm. so they moved to Holland in order to 
maintain that community. But they realized if they stayed there, their kids weren't going to be speaking English. So we're going to lose what it meant to be English at that point. So that's why they came to America to set up their own thing. They were going to have to work really hard for it. But they wanted to show people how life could be done. Mm-hmm. They called them, so they, then they used a city on a hill, the analogy from the Bible, to just try and figure out, okay, how should life be done? And how do we do that as well? So people living in the diaspora can see their lives that way. That if, if, if you think through everything I don't want to see happen in Iraq, everything I do want to see happen in Iraq, I want to embody that myself. And I want to embody that in the community here for the sake of being a light right. and being and helping demonstrate how life should be lived and what that should look like. Right. Right. Like, do what you can on your end. Like, my mom just came back from there, right? And um, she saw, like, many impoverished families and widowed families and... Like, just giving them a simple, like, gift of, like, bedding or, like, a, a, worth, a month's worth of food. Like, that, that's what it comes back to. Like, how are you helping your own people? You know, like, you, you can sit there and you can say I hate it and... Say I wish it was different as many times as you want, but like, what are you doing to change it? Absolutely. And that starts with, according to the Bible, what do I, what do I, how do I need to work on me? Yeah. First. Yeah. Rather than what's wrong with other people. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here for this conversation. Well, um, thank you for having me. And thank you guys for listening to the Almeida Initiative podcast. We will be back next week with another episode.